right. Well, we talk a lot about data, how important it is for information and how important information is in order to, you know, have a successful business. It's the whole idea behind this class. So we should probably talk about how to actually acquire that data, right? Because if you can't get the data, how are you supposed to, you know, do all that other stuff? So let's get into it. So when we talk about data acquisition, usually what we're doing is we're acquiring our data from where it originally is sourced from and moving it into sort of a, a special area within our business intelligence system. Uh, if we're running some sort of operation in our business, we don't necessarily want to do our analysis with the data that's already in that operational area for several reasons. Um, you could end up losing a lot of information. Uh, if, if you make a mistake, you could actually wipe out a lot of really important information. So like, let's say if you're trying to do analysis of customer purchases or something like that inside of your database that actually has all of the purchasing info and you accidentally permanently delete all of the uh, payment information for all of the customers, that could be really bad. So we want to, rather than actually keeping everything exactly where it is and doing the analysis there, we actually want to take that data and uh, move it out to somewhere else that is specifically um, designed for working on actual data analysis. Um, what we can also do with data acquisition is uh, we can actually streamline it for data analysis because typically organizational data is going to be more kept in a streamlined form for usability within the actual organizational processes. So you might have a lot of, say, unnecessary information that is necessary for those pieces, but that you don't really need to care about for your analysis and for your predictions or something like that. They might be in different file formats that you can't really use and you have to convert them into uh, something that you can use for, anal for analysis. Um, data, especially when you have data that's not necessarily intended for people to be looking at, data tends to be kept in forms that are very, very specifically meant to be passed around easily between computers, and that can make research really difficult. So we actually have to worry about pulling the data out of there and um, transforming it into something us usable for us. Uh, it can be fragmented across several systems. Uh, maybe you have stuff like, uh, if, if you're trying to figure out um, what pages customers are visiting as well as the stuff that they're buying, right? You're trying to look at the entire path they take through your website before actually buying something. The pages that they visit might be in a completely different place than the uh, actual um, purchasing information, the products that they bought. Uh, and maybe more information about the customer demographics and that kind of stuff. So all of that could be kept completely separately. And then finally, um, you need to actually have your own dedicated processing power for data analysis because it takes up a lot of processing power. Companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook do so, so, so much data analysis and they have massive, massive, massive servers dedicated just for that, that don't even touch the website hosting, that don't even touch the um, advertising um, auction systems, all that kind of stuff. They have stuff just for data processing. And that's the kind of thing you need to worry about as well, is you need to be able to dedicate hardware just for data processing so you're not getting in the way of the other things that are happening or you're not slowing down your own processing. You want your processing to be as efficient as possible. So that's why we actually go about acquiring data. And data acquiring is all about obtaining data. So you actually have to get it from somewhere so that you can use it. We need to clean the data up. We need to actually transform it into something we can use something, you know, get rid of anything that's unnecessary, maybe um, get rid of, say, if like we have 
one thing that we could use with uh, actually obtaining data, if we're obtaining, say, a click map, cleaning the data would probably be getting rid of a whole lot of stuff that's left behind by the user just moving their mouse over a short period of time. So we don't necessarily want, like, everything. I said click map, I think, back there. It's a heat map. We don't necessarily want the entirety of the heat map. Maybe we only care about the really, really, really popular spots so we can flush out a lot of that information and keep really what's most important. Uh, organizing, because the data from a lot of different sources is going to be in organized in a lot of different ways and we have to reorganize everything in a way that benefits our systems. The, um, the introduction of MIS chapter 3, which I highly recommend you read through the introduction to get an example of some of the databases people are able to use like for example the public voter registration database which gives people's names and addresses and whatnot um would be a database that's quite frequently used by companies but maybe the organization of that particular particular database is not a helpful organization for you so you might need to uh, you know, clean it, get rid of some of the information that's not in there, and then organize it, move the attributes around, move the actual data points, the, the people around. Uh, that all could be part of it. And then there's cataloging, which is really interesting. Uh, cataloging is for all the data that you're getting, uh, you want to actually do something that's known as tagging it. You're introducing this metadata data about data that tells you know what your system hey this data has this kind of content in it so for example with the uh, data that i showed in the last video regarding the bicycle stuff the metadata might be might include stuff like you know you tag it with customer with contact with order because it's ordering data right parts numbers, all that kind of stuff. Um, useful information that might make it easier for you to find later if you're trying to search through your databases for you know that particular data. Cataloging is an extremely important piece of data acquisition because if you can't find the data you obtained, you might as well not have obtained it in the first place. So because we don't analyze our data in place usually what you do is you extract that data and you send it to your analysts. If you're in charge of actually doing the extraction and all that kind of stuff, you're going to send it to your analysts, but you need a place to hold it in the meantime, which is where the data warehouse comes in. And it's a facility for data acquisition. Now this could be a facility in terms of this warehouse is an actual building full of servers with data on it, or it could be you know, we dedicate this one little computer in our business in order to hold the data that we're using right here. Facility isn't necessarily literally a facility. It depends on the need for your business. And this is a general idea of what a data warehouse does is it's taking all of this information here, the operational databases, the purchase data and the social data, and it runs it through some process that does all the extraction and cleaning and preparation for analysis. And then it has to save it somewhere. The DBMS would be a database management system. So you keep it in the data warehouse's database so that it can sit there and until it's ready to be used. The data warehouse metadata is also really important. That's that metadata that I talked about when we were talking about cataloging. What you would do if you're looking, if you're a uh, analyst who is looking for a particular piece of data, is you would go into the data warehouse metadata, and you would search that sort of like you would a card catalog in a library, uh, whether that's a physical card catalog if you're used to that, or one of those uh, computers that essentially acts like a search engine within the library, which is you know more modern. But regardless, you have this metadata that you search through until so that you can actually find the right uh, collection of data and then you can fish that collection of data from the data warehouse database because the metadata helps you 
understand where it's actually contained. And then uh, that business intelligence tool side of things is actually the, you know, that is how business intelligence users access the data from the warehouse. They use a tool in order to pull the data from the actual database. So the tool talks to the data warehouse and says, hey, can I have this database? The database will check, okay, are you authorized to use it? Uh, do we even have the data that you're looking for? Yes, good, here's what we have. We can give it to you and that kind of stuff. So that, that goes back to the tool and then the business intelligence users can actually use that data. Now, I briefly mentioned purchase data in that last picture. Uh, purchase data is, well, data that you can purchase. And there are a lot of databases that are out there for data that you can buy. A lot of companies make a lot of money finding and cataloging and giving uh, and selling uh, purchase data. And here's just some examples of data you can get super easily. Name, address, phone, age, gender, ethnicity, religion, income, education, voter registration, home ownership, vehicles, magazine subscriptions, hobbies, catalog orders, marital status, height, weight, hair, and eye color, uh, information about spouse, spouses and children's information. Um, you have a lot of information that you can get about your customers and conversely there's a lot of information that businesses can get about you um, these are all contained in different databases uh, collected by companies and then sold to other companies so they can do stuff like market to you now of course data can be problematic there's no one perfect um there's no one perfect database that's out there. Uh, for example, you can have values that are incorrect. That's bad. You can have missing values, not desirable depending on which values they are. Um, we actually saw that database at the near the beginning of the last video that had some information missing about contact names and titles. Uh, that's missing values. And in that case, it wasn't that big of a deal. Other cases, there can be um, there there can be it can be a big deal if that data is really helpful. But missing data is pretty common. Um, a lot of databases have a percent missing uh, from the actual vendors. The vendors are the people who sell data. Uh, vendors will list a database as having a certain percentage of missing values with a lower percentage being better um, but typically it's not the uh, the worst thing in the world data can be inconsistent especially if it changes over time stuff like uh, party affiliation can change over time age uh, spouses information can change any sort of medical related information can definitely change uh, all that kind of stuff. Things can change over time, so it's important to keep in mind how old that data is. The wrong granularity is a really interesting one, because granularity refers to the amount of detail that something has. So for example, you can have data that is too fine, it has too fine of a granularity, which means there's too much detail, it's too precise, and it's giving you all this kind of stuff that you don't really need versus too coarse would be not precise enough. Uh, for example, if you are managing an online storefront and you have a record of every place that the user um, moved their mouse, not in the sense of like a heat map over multiple users, but you just have a log of the user moving their mouse across the entire website without any of that page information, product information, that kind of stuff, that could be too precise because you don't necessarily need to know exactly where the mouse is at all times. Maybe what's most important is the actual click, right? Um, or in a physical store, if we have cameras that monitor the movements of customers, do we care about every single 
thing that a customer does? Do we care about every single step they take, every head motion, every single like stretch they do or something like that? Or do we really care about what products they're looking at? You know, like what, what general areas of the store they're hanging out in and then what items they eventually buy. So the, you know, keeping track of all of the customers' movements might be too fine of granularity versus the um, just keeping track of what they're looking at and what they're buying would be a better amount. Two course would be not precise amount. Um, an example with the online storefront and actually the physical store too, is that if you only record that a customer, whether or not a customer bought something, not even what they bought, just whether or not they bought something, that would be too coarse because it would be more helpful to know what they bought, right? So you can try to get more information about what products they're selling. You could get information about what that particular customer is interested in, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's better if you have to have data that's too coarse or too fine, it's better to have data that is too fine because you can make it coarser to get useful information out of it. For example, if you have every single movement that a customer makes with their mouse on your online storefront, you can extract from that uh, the clicks, the actual, you know, places that they clicked on your website, and from there get the history of like what items they're looking at. Versus with two course, if you only know that the customer bought something or that the customer didn't buy something, you can't get more information out of that. And then finally, you can have too much data in terms of too many attributes. Uh, sometimes you don't need to know every single piece of information that's out there about every single customer. Uh, or you can have too many data points. You can be trying to track too many customers. And the downside with both of these is that it heavily increases the amount of processing time when you're actually trying to analyze it, especially if a lot of that information is just unnecessary. So with the attributes, you can actually just remove the attributes completely. It's very, very easy to do. Um, for example, with the uh, bikes, um, bike parts store that we talked about in the first video, uh, it would be really easy to just get rid of the contact person if you're just trying to look at what parts are selling. So you wouldn't need to know about the contact person or their title because for this particular study, you're not trying to actually contact that person. You're just looking at the orders themselves. Too many data points would be, uh, say, too many companies in the bike parts example, you know, too many orders, or it might be, say, if I'm trying to keep track of student performance over multiple classes of multiple sections of a certain class, too many data points might be, I'm keeping track of too many students and I can't handle all of this data. And in that case, uh, you can try to take a representative sample of your consumer base, trying to make that sample look like one that, um, that actually look like your customer demographics. You take that representative sample and you can run studies on it and then try to apply those studies on the sample to the entire population. That's kind of the idea of when people do research on say medication, new medication. They do trials on a representative sample of the population where they'll, they'll try to be like, okay, if we have a representative sample and this is the kind of effect we get out of this medication, then we can assume with this amount of certainty that this is what the medication will do for the whole population. Or like uh, human behavioral studies, you can't really test every single person, so you have to pick representative samples. Also, it's the same thing for political surveys or stuff like that. So representative samples are how we address too many data points. Now, there's a lot of different pieces of data out there, and sometimes you have a lot of data that's really helpful for a business as a whole, but individual pieces of that business might have a hard time using everything. A lot of that might be really unnecessary for them. Uh, for example, you might want to get all kinds of information about all of your customers. So you want to look at the things that they have bought. You want to look at the pages they have visited on your website. 
you know, look at all of that kind of stuff, but you also want to get demographic information on your customer so you can try to figure out, you know, what demographics are really digging our products. What uh, demographics are, you know, how, how can we best advertise to our customers based on the demographics? Like you have all these different questions and things that you might want to involve yourself in. The marketing people might be really interested in the demographics stuff, but the people who are working on, say, you know, actually acquiring stock so that they can buy certain, you know, they, they need to buy the parts they need in order to produce the product that people like, they don't really care about the demographic side of things. They need to know what's selling the most so that they can do some, like, just-in-time inventory ordering. They can buy all the parts that they need without buying too much of stuff that they don't need, stuff that will sit around for a while. So they don't care about all the demographic stuff. And this is where the idea of a data mart comes in. It's a collection of data that addresses the need of a particular functional area of business. So maybe there's a marketing data mart, there's an operations data mart, there's all kinds of different data marts for different things. A really good, uh, data mart idea for this kind of company as well might be a data mart specifically for running the website. So if they're getting information about how many pages are being clicked at one time, how many simultaneous users there are, the pages that are being clicked versus the pages that aren't being clicked, all of that kind of stuff might be really useful for them so that they can structure the website better, they can uh, get additional service space if that's needed, all that kind of stuff. So a data mart does sound a bit like a warehouse, but a warehouse actually does the acquiring of the data. It distributes subsets of that data to data marts depending on their needs. So an organization will have a data warehouse and then that data warehouse will say, will see all of the data marts that are in the company, cut up all of that data into different subsets of that data and then pass those subsets along to the data marts. The data marts actually acquire each data subset and then do the analysis. So the data marts involve the storage of every subset of data as well as the analysis of that subset of data. So here is an example diagram that includes data marts and the data warehouse itself. You have the data warehouse on the left with its databases. And then you have the three data marts. You have the web sales data, data mart for this example, the store sales data mart, and the inventory data mart. And each of those are going to need different pieces of data. So example, for example, the web log data, where all the customers are going on the website, uh, as well as the sales that are being made on the website. And this could then be used for uh, clickstream analysis to figure out you know, where are people clicking, what areas of interest are on the website, and that can go out to um, the group that will then try to design better features for the website. Uh, store sales, that will go into the store management tools, which will then head into the um, actual analysis for sales training and stuff. And then you have the inventory history data for the inventory data mart to make sure that everything is actually being um, stocked the right way. You have all the stock that you need, you're not, you're not going to run out of things that people want to get, and you're not going to hold on to things that people don't want to get for too long. And that'll go out to analysis so that people can figure out optimal item picking, for example. Now, having a data warehouse can be very, very expensive um, if you're trying to hold a lot of data there. And even maintaining multiple data marts can be very, very expensive. So sometimes people will actually use uh, businesses that are in their entirety data warehouses. So you can get data from a data warehouse business in order to use that as your own, uh, in your own business intelligence systems. Sometimes there are companies of which the they are entirely just one data mart. They get stuff from data warehouses and then they hold that data within themselves and provide the tools and stuff and then do the actual analysis of that data. So this isn't necessarily one big company. 
sometimes these are subcontracted companies that are doing the you know the data mart side of things they are uh they take particular subsets of the data of data that you give them and they do the analysis for you and give you the results or sometimes there are companies where you go to them because they are a data warehouse and you take data from them in order to uh, actually do the analysis that you want to do so there's a lot of different options but yeah that is the introduction to uh, data obtaining data acquiring data